Once British Columbia was a virtual ocean of trees. The early pioneers saw millions of acres of forest containing some of the finest timber in the world. Magnificent Douglas fir, red cedar, spruce, hemlock, and pines. So great was the forest and so large were the trees on the coast in particular that some early settlers despaired of ever clearing the land for habitation and farming. The first loggers thought they could never overcut the vast forests of British Columbia. They cut the biggest, best and most accessible timber. High stumps and an incredible tangle of slash was left in the wake of logging operations. There was no thought of reforestation and forest fires were of concern only if they threatened towns or communities. Men worked hard long hours to cut as much timber as they could for a growing market. From the beginning, the forest industry was British Columbia's principal source of revenue. The major ports of the province were crowded with vessels from a score of nations. First sailing ships, then steam-powered freighters lining up in the ports to take away an endless stream of boards and timbers, pulp, paper and plywood. The senior foresters of the day were at least as responsible for the development of new world markets for timber products as they were for safeguarding the forest resource. Finally, forestry was coming into its own. A reservoir of knowledge was building up. A school of forestry was established at the University of British Columbia. The forester knew there were precedents for the overcutting of forests, precedents as ancient as the cedar forests of Lebanon, cut down by a not-so-wise Solomon for use in his own domains, precedents as recent as the decimation of the forests of Minnesota and Illinois, once thought to be inexhaustible and man was not the only force that encroached on the forest. A variety of insect infestations could spell ruin. Forest fires wiped out millions of acres, and in some cases left areas in such a condition that they would take years to regenerate. It was becoming clearly evident that man, assisted by insects, disease, and fire, could effectively wipe out the largest forests. A major factor influencing the future of the forest resource was the dramatic improvement in utilization brought about largely by changing economics and more efficient machinery. Faced with the problem of trees virtually too big to log and mill, the loggers and the sawmill men came up with machines and methods as big as the trees. The skid road with its oxen and horsepower gave way to the steam donkey and then to more efficient versions of the yarding machine. Methods for yarding logs out of the woods became more efficient year after year. Miles of track were laid into previously inaccessible forest areas. It was now economically possible to transport lower quality logs over longer distances. The tugboat industry grew with the forest industry. Bigger, more powerful tugs towed larger log booms to bigger, more efficient sawmills. Once again, cutting cost, enabling lower grade logs to be used. It was a sawmill economy. Sawmills were designed to supply world markets with boards and timbers. Sawmilling was geared to cut big trees, but few, if any, mills could handle small trees economically. Many small trees were knocked over in the logging operation or were left standing in a damaged condition. Even the big logs going through the mill emerged at the other end with up to 50% of their bulk reduced to waste. Waste in the form of sawdust, bark covered slabs, trimmed out knots and other defects. The waste had to be disposed of and the mill burner was a landmark across the province. Logging and sawmilling were the backbone of the provincial economy. This was as plain as the smoke by day and the glow by night of the burner cones that towered above every sawmill. So the government and its foresters were alerted to the possibility of a wasting forest resource. The first forest reserve was established in 1914, the first positive step to safeguard the forest resource. And by 1945, many more provincial forests had been established. In that year, a royal commission headed by Chief Justice Gordon Sloan examined the concept of forest perpetuation in depth and made many important and constructive recommendations to the government, most or all of which emphasized the overlying principle of sustained yield. A second commission was held in 1955. 
Basically, this principle requires at least as much new growth in British Columbia's forests each year as is logged and is destroyed by fire, insects, and disease. It works this way. The available forest resources are divided into two principal kinds of management units. Tree farm licenses, which are managed by private concerns with constant supervision by the Forest Service, and public sustained yield units, which are administered directly by the Forest Service. Since 1947, the Forest Service has pursued a policy to put all forested crown lands under sustained yield. Because 95% of the forested lands in BC are held by the Crown, the Forest Service has been able to proceed effectively. Today, some two-thirds of the province's productive forest lands have been placed under some form of sustained yield, with some 80 public sustained yield units and 35 tree farm licenses in existence. With the extension of the PGE Railroad into the presently undeveloped north, sustained yield will be introduced into those areas in a planned and progressive manner. To a casual observer traveling along public highways and roads, it may appear that certain provincial forests are being overcut because of the visible evidences of logging. Such areas have been logged because they are readily accessible to transportation. Elsewhere in these areas, logging has not begun and the logged off areas you see will not be logged again for approximately 100 years and then will be given another century to rest and grow again. Simply stated, sustained yield means that something in the range of 1% of any public sustained yield unit is logged in any one year. The actual amount of wood available yearly to all the parties holding cutting rights in a sustained yield unit is termed the allowable annual cut. The figure is determined through an inventory of the timber, together with an estimate of the growth potential of forests. True, the forest resource was being managed under the principle of sustained yield, but there were problems. The standard of utilization at that time resulted in damage and destruction to smaller trees. The resulting tangle was a fire hazard which had to be disposed of, causing intense smoke pollution at various times of the year. Operators who took the responsibility to cut and remove smaller trees were not rewarded for their efforts because everything they cut, big trees or small, was charged to their total allowable cut. In addition to this, there were and are types of forests in British Columbia which do not fit economically into calculations for the allowable cut. For instance, logging of small diameter lodgepole pine was impractical under the existing economic conditions. Finally, in the sawmill, the 50% waste on every log sawn continued to prevail, with the waste burners contributing to the general pollution of the air. Many operators installed new machinery in an attempt to overcome these problems. They installed equipment for processing smaller and shorter logs. Originally, sustained yield was put into effect in what was almost exclusively a sawmill economy. Mills in the interior cut only boards and timbers, while on the coast, Sawmills predominated over plywood and pulp and paper plants. The 1950s saw the start of major technological changes, and the day of a straight sawmill economy was well on its way to eclipse, replaced by a multi-product economy that included the manufacture of increasing quantities of plywood and several varieties of hardboard and particle board, all relying on wood fibers or chips. Most significant of all was the introduction of the pulp and paper plant to the interior of the province. One thing is certain, the principle and practice of sustained yield is still a governing factor in the forest industry. It relies for its successful application on the fact that under the utilization standards of a sawmill economy, much timber was left in the form of damaged or shattered younger trees, trees too small in diameter to qualify for cutting, trees in low quality defective stands and waste. Fortunately, all that is changing due to the large and increasing demand for chips for the pulp and paper industry and due as well to new methods being employed both in the woods and in the sawmills. Since the phasing in of close utilization began in 1966, operators have been able to elect to remain with their saw log allowable cut or to take advantage of incentives provided for those who adopt better utilization practices. The incentives, simply stated, are these. 
In exchange for the operator's indicated willingness to minimize waste and to install a barker and chipper, he is allowed to cut one-third more timber than was allowed for under his basic saw log allowable cut. Here then is the pattern for existing operators and new operators to follow as we enter the age of maximum use of our forest resource. The allowable cut under close utilization specifications includes trees with a diameter down to eight inches at a one-foot stump. Thus the close utilization allowable cut can be much higher than it was under a strictly sawmill economy and still conform with the principle of sustained yield. Equipment has been developed to log under these conditions. The chain saw, of course, is standard equipment in the woods. But the tree shears have proven even more effective, snipping trees close to the ground and well within the one-foot stump limit. Tractors, rubber-tired skidders, and other forms of mobile equipment work quickly and efficiently in the woods, conducting the yarding and loading of logs, as well as of chunks and pieces that would have been left in the woods under the old system. Barking and chipping operations in stands of timber that are comprised mainly of small trees, with the chips being delivered directly to the pulp and paper plant, are already being tried. In the sawmill, a whole range of technical improvements have been introduced. These include barkers of different types, and chippers capable of handling whole logs as well as the slabs, edgings, and trimmed pieces that once constituted a major part of sawmill waste. There are saw chipper combinations and high speed saws that produce a narrower cut than head saws used previously. Therefore, less waste in the form of sawdust. Pulp mills are now able to utilize a lower grade chip in the pulp and newsprint process. Even sawdust is being used. All of this adds up to a dramatic reduction of wood waste. It makes possible the utilization of diseased trees and tree pieces that were once left in the forest. Close or maximum utilization means exactly what it says. The processing of every usable part of a tree and the cutting and removal of all trees from an allocated timber holding. Operators who elect to perform under such an agreement are offered incentives in the form of lower stumpage charges and in the form of an increased rate of cut. Areas so logged look like this. Trees cut close to the ground. Most slash and other wood debris removed and converted into chips. The cleared area, unscarred by slash fires, ready now for effective reforestation and multiple forest land use. Now, as never before, the Forest Service can move into these areas left after logging and put into effect a planned program of reseeding and planting a minimum of 75 million seedlings annually. These new forest tracts will be fertilized where required, thinned and managed just like any crop of great value, and ultimately harvested employing the most effective techniques. This is the underlying principle of forest management, aimed at perpetuating the forest resource of the province. As new forests grow up on logged areas, they become part of managed multiple use programs to protect watersheds, fish and game habitats, and the development of outdoor recreation amenities. The benefits to everyone, a greater return per acre, both in money and opportunity for recreation, therefore a benefit to society. The reduction of fire hazard and smoke pollution. More forest industry to meet the world demand, therefore more employment. Perpetual forests, this is sustained yield.